All righty. Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington, serving online information entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. and the world. Welcome to my guest today, Dr. David Schultz. I am super excited to bring you Dr. Schultz in a new episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. Welcome, David. Uh, thank you. Glad to be here. It's, we're opposite ends of our day, your evening, because you're over in, what's your city again? Stockholm? Stockholm. Yeah. Stockholm. Yeah. Um, I'm in Seattle. Super good to see you. I'm really excited for folks to hear about your work today. So mm. we met, how many years has it been? A couple of years? Two years? Yeah. Two years ago through a mutual friend slash acquaintance, somebody that I met at one of my live events that I was speaking at. Um, and quickly became a fan of you and your work. And I, I love, I would say that one of the things that I love about the way that you approach your work is how creative slash non-traditional, like you have a very interesting way of approaching the, the way that you help your clients achieve results. And so I can't wait to get to that for, for folks that don't know Dr. David Schultz, David is an executive business coach who provides executive coaching online. His specialty is guiding you to a deeper understanding of yourself while gently and respectfully going to the root of the issue for a permanent solution. Being a professional executive coach and having a doctorate in clinical psychology is a powerful combination for dealing with triggers at work or negative patterns of behaviors or reactions to people or situations one may feel stuck in. David's one-on-one -on -one coaching has helped clients from many industries and backgrounds. He also provides executive coaching for entrepreneurs at all stages in their careers. And we'll talk about where people can find you in a bit, but welcome, David. Thank you. So I would love to know, because I think you started in construction, right? Do I have that right? <laughs> you heard that in another podcast. <laughs> Well, yeah, actually, they had a little, little bit wrong. I was a general contractor and, and uh, I was building custom homes. First, I worked for U.S. Homes and then uh, as a construction manager in my early 20s. And then I started my own business. Uh, in the nice. building. Uh, you know, we would uh, design homes with my architect and custom build houses until the markets crashed. That's uh, another story. Right. Before I went back to get my education in psychology, I had a business degree before that. Oh, excellent. So you had a business degree before you went into construction, yes. general contracting, fun. As a general contractor, right? Right. I, I'm not very talented as far as actually making things myself, to be honest. <laughs> well, I didn't it's know interesting. What was, and they didn't care at U.S. Homes. They just gave you a manual. They just measured your aptitude. And if you had the right aptitude, then they hired you. You know, they, I didn't love want that. You know, they wanted you to learn it their way. Well, the interesting thing about that is, have you have you ever taken the Colby test? No, I don't think so. So it's a test. I think what they call it, it's a test that measures um, your conal like conal strengths. And it's the only test of its kind, but it basically assesses like kind of what and how you're motivated, whether you're intrinsically motivated, whether you're outwardly motivated so towards something. And mm -hmm. it goes across four areas, but it turns out some people can conceptualize. They can see it in their head. They don't need to build it. They don't need to be the one to be able to do it with their hands Mm -hmm. Like they've got the design, they can put the plans in place. That sounds like that could be one of your strengths, but you don't actually have to be the guy doing it, right? Well, that was one of my favorite parts was designing the houses with the architect together. And I would go into other homes uh, that were for sale, spec homes, and take pictures of different things I liked. And then I kind of told them to stick it together. And yeah, we had fun. I, I really did enjoy that, but that was a small portion of the work, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I'm curious what attracted you to a business degree in the first place. How did you choose business? Well, I kind of fell into that, um, you know, just because I come from a family that's 
you know, business oriented. So I don't think I was really thinking about it, to be honest, I just kind of fell into it. But then later after the construction business and uh, in getting knocked on my bottom side pretty well, I would say, um, which is well, a learning experience if you can get back up. It's not about getting knocked down in my mind, it's about getting back up. So, and then I, you know, worked my way through a master's in, or two masters and a uh, doctorate in clinical psychology. And then I started being a therapist, psychologist, and then and I was always into mind and consciousness. In fact, when I first went back to school, I was trying to get into UCLA research master's program um, and just kind of learn more about the mind and consciousness. So that was really what I was after. And still, that's what I'm after, to be honest. That's really what, what I like. So the way I work is quite different than most ways. And it's I think it's kind of like the new zeitgeist in, uh, in business coaching, which most of these methods originate in psychology. So since it was kind of that zeitgeist in psychology, it's now coming into business coaching. And I've yeah. been in it for a while, though, so I'm pretty deep into it. When did you notice or when or where did that interest start? Like at what age did you notice you had a really strong interest in mind and consciousness? Well, I remember <laughs> it's interesting. Well, actually, if I go way back in high school, I remember getting there was a life, not magazine, but it was a uh, like a little annual book they put out on the mind. And they just explained it in so many different ways, like so many brains could light a light bulb or something like that. All these weird ways of looking at things. And I found that very interesting. It just, you know, they're thinking outside the envelope. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. And uh, and I just also remember like um, maybe in around 19 or 20, I remember at that time I was in Dallas and I remember being at the swimming pool, reading this like thousand page book on the brain. <laughs> And I met someone uh, at 19 I, or 20. This is yeah, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, yeah, really? Um, I just was always interested in things like that. So kind of a nerd, I guess, in a way. No, I like it. It's it's I think it's so fun when when you get to look back and see like how strong that interest was even early on. And now here you are, right? Having gone through business school and construction and now you live in this field of overlapping business and the mind and consciousness. Yeah, I kind of fell into the uh, business coaching side of it from working with a lot of clients as a therapist, as a private therapist. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, as we're working through issues, you know, I noticed a lot of that carried into their work or their work carried into their private. And so I started applying my methods towards business coaching and it was uh, very effective. And that's generally how I got in the door to a lot of big companies is just through, um, well, initially working with a person privately and then seeing, and then they realize, oh, wow, we're doing a lot of stuff from their work with this method. So it's, uh, it's very effective. So I, I, you know, I kind of fell into it by chance, I guess. I, I would love to know, cause part of me is really curious about what, if anything, you felt like didn't work as well in the therapy model? Because I know we've talked a little bit, you know, outside of this conversation about the creativity and some of the stuff you get to bring to your coaching model, right? right. Is it is it different than therapy? Is it largely the same? Talk to us about kind of the therapy world that you lived in and the coaching world that you are also in now. Well, I guess... To do that, I'd have to kind of explain the model I work from mm -hmm. or I developed over the years. So the model looks at self a little bit differently. Um, it's not this monolithic, um, uh, you know, item. It's more of a different parts of self. Self, I look at it from a systems-based perspective. I look at self as a system made up of different parts of self. And that's kind of the zeitgeist in psychology. So it's systems based thinking uh, coming from family systems, not to get in too much depth. Mm -hmm. And there's many models of that. And uh, and basically one person came up with the idea of applying the multiplicity of self or the mind 
and systems thinking. So instead of looking at a family and each person individually uh, and how they interact with each other, he applied it to the mind. And uh, so, for example, when you're fighting with yourself, you can just think of some part is wanting one thing, another part wants another. There could be multiple perspectives within you. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a certain state of, um, like when you're in your emotional intelligence, let's say, uh, it's different than our normal rational logic. It's an emotional logic. And those parameters are much wider. So you're able to um, deal with all kinds of issues uh, that normally you can't get at, at with just, you know, reasoning and logic and rational thinking. And we're driven by that a lot. And the ultimate goal is to synergize both sides so that you get a gestalt or more. One plus one is more than two in this sense. So, so for me, it's really about that. So I, I get them into this dream lo logic, hypno logic or emotional intelligence. Mm. Am I getting too nerdy on you? No, I love that because my next question was going to be, is it then the kind of the first goal of the work to get somebody out that who's probably stuck in that rational, you know, like rational brain trying to logic their way through everything over more into the emotional side? Well, generally, the first step I do is I uh, have them explain what it is they want to work on, you know, mm -hmm. so I then what I do is reframe it into the way I look at it, into parts language. So they can relate to it. So it's their issue, it's what they wanna work on. And then as they describe it to me, I, I have an ear for this from doing this for 20 years mm -hmm. of, of hearing these different parts as they describe themselves, parts of themselves. And so then what I do is I just take what they say and I reframe it into this language and then they can relate to what I'm talking about. If I use some sort of third party thing, it would be harder to relate to it, but when it's their own stuff and then I reframe it this way, then they, they get it. Uh, it makes more sense to them. And it's a step-by-step -step process to get them uh, more into this process, I guess. Totally. Well, and I mean, in your bio, right, you said, well, helping people get to a deeper understanding of themselves while gently and respectfully going to the root of the issue. I know that you're a really methodical, careful person. Mm -hmm. Does part do, of me is part of you, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I walk the walk, you know, I can't just talk the talk. Hilarious. Part of you is. That's right. And what part is that? Let me do, let me just well, my Joker part. That's my co therapist. Right. Way, just so you know, and I know this will probably scare off a few people, <laughs> but my Joker part named itself Paul. And, um, my co-therapist and it's i got the name from a movie but i can't remember the name of the movie right now but it was it had paul newman in there oh cool hand luke oh i love paul newman yeah it was an early movie where he's in a prison louisiana prison as a prisoner and he was kind of a joker and you know and he was it is a classic movie i thought mm. and uh so then my joker part wanted to be named after the character in the movie <laughs> Uh, Luke, but I forgot the name of the character, so he just named himself Paul because he liked Paul. You know, you know, the Paul oh, name. that's so funny. That's well, that's not Paul, yeah. Totally, and that's a great example because I was gonna say, do does it take people a while to figure out their parts, or once they're kind of walked into the process, does it come up pretty quickly for them? What have you noticed with your clients? Usually by I mean, usually the first meeting will be just getting more background and maybe me reframing it. Mm -hmm. And then by the second meeting, I'll have them connect and work with their parts. Um, you know, some people it's the third meeting, some people it's in the first meeting. So it depends how long the meeting is and so forth. And then I get them acclimated to it. And then it's off to the races after that. Once I know they can do it and they feel comfortable with it. And then we basically target whatever they want to target. So actually the method I call mind targeting so it's just whatever they want to work at, we can target their mind. And it takes them kind of to a, a deeper, just kind of like what's under the hood. You know, you're going to see really what's going on inside you. And it's kind of fun, actually. I mean, once people get that, it's hard to think the way they used to think because it's more explicit. They get more information and it's there's a good function to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's usually very helpful for a lot of people. Mm. 
Well, and I was going to say this, this separating what you typically think of as yourself, like a single unit self mm -hmm. to part, what do you see as, and I think I know the answer, but what do you see as the greater benefit of this work compared to other models? Um, well, I think because people come in to work on some topic, but when they leave, they often know themselves in a whole nother way. Mm. And they also, you know, very often, you know, since I am a systems thinker, I think of these different parts of self, there's a structure, usually there's protector parts, there's vulnerable parts. And, um, and it's, and it happens by default. It's not like a conscious process. We, we, you know, from our experiences over time, people get set up in a certain way, but it's not necessarily, necessarily the most efficient way or even the way that makes you most happy. So by deconstructing and getting a look at the dynamics of what's going on with a person, you can, um, you know, they can restructure it. We work with the parts. I mean, there's a systems expression which I heard and I wish I knew who said it, uh, but I like it a lot. And they said it's it's not it's not about working outside the box. It's not what's inside the box. It's the box. So that's the system, the self system. So we're working with the system. We're not working with you know outside or inside. We're working with the structure that's keeping you locked in basically. So if you're in dysfunctional patterns or ways of being and you can't get out of them or reactions or so forth, this helps you restructure that. Mm. Can you, obviously without disclosing names or identity, can you give us some examples of like, what are some of the client issues that people come in with, especially in the entrepreneurial space? Well, and I realize I mean, some of these could be business. Some of these could be personal that trail over into business, right? It's all connected. I, I consider it a false dichotomy, actually, mm. because the same parts of you are at home, at work, whatever. <laughs> no, and right. But people may tend to think like, oh, I have a time management problem or I have a, you know what I mean, a productivity problem or something that is causing a pain point or a pinch point for them. I guess I'm curious what you see as people identifying as the, the pinch point that really could be something else entirely. To be honest, I don't really, always, I, I don't have the answers for my clients, mm -hmm. um, but I guide them to listen to themselves in a new way at a level uh, so often there's dissonance within a person, like they are, they're fighting with themselves or they, they're getting pulled in different directions. So I literally have a meeting of their different parts of self on the topic and they will, you know, and I have a lot of structures and techniques I've developed for doing that so they can work out their differences. And, and so you're not using this because I think of our energy as being a closed system. So instead of fighting with ourselves, if we get the synergy between the parts where they find a solution that they can all sign off on, then all that energy can be, you know, aimed at going forward instead of, you know, fighting with yourself. So that's kind of the structure. And the answers really reside in the clients, but they, but they don't know they have them because, you know, different parts can bring up different information that you can't always access normally. So it is pretty, I'm pretty surprised. It's like, you know, you may feel like it's going to go one direction, but it's kind of like when the jury goes out and, and you know, eight of them think one way and, and one thinks the other and you think it's going to win. But if that person persuades the other ones, then, of course, that one ends up turning them to their side. So you never know how it goes. It's, and I don't know the answers even. It's not for me to answer them. I figure the people I work with are experts in their own fields. And I'm just helping them get to know themselves at a deeper level and to work out the dissonance that they have in themselves or the things that they feel aren't where they want to be, or if they just want to be more productive and just really kind of gain. Cause as you learn about yourself in this way, you also understand other people better and you can understand like what part of you is being triggered by what part of them, instead of saying them and you, it gets much more specific. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Mm. My way of seeing it, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it is interesting. And I think that you've like definitely decide, described the, you know, conceptually how the process goes. Can you bring that to life a little bit by giving us an example of like a client having dissonance among parts, like describe what that could look like? Well, I mean, for example, 
if someone's trying to decide whether they want to leave a company and go to a different company, um, if they, you know, if they're really upset with somebody, but they have to, but it's a customer or their boss or, or someone under them. They have to work with. Yeah. So they're kind of forced into this. So, you know, it's, it's to get them to work through this stuff. Uh, if they're feeling extra anxious or worried or feel like they're an imposter that they, even though they're very successful, but they don't deserve it. I never really know where it goes because once they start to explore, turn over each stone and see what's underneath, you know, it, it, it can change as we work, you know, to what's really going on. Uh, so sometimes you start at one level, but when you start to really find out what's going on, it's, it's quite different. And it and the things that you carry into it can be things that are are things that you've had for a while that are getting triggered or bring uh, brought up. So we actually follow that trailhead. Your mind will take you where you need to go to resolve the issues. So we just follow that, and it you know it's quite fascinating. Mm. And, uh, you know, so it helps with many things. It, it it improves things at at work, but also at home or in all environments that you're dealing with. So when to help people un, who are listening understand like, huh, you know, even dissecting this, this concept of parts, like what parts do I have is, are the parts usually equated to roles? Like if somebody was listening and going like, oh, my mom part or my, my work or, you know, entrepreneur owner part, like, can you describe what those parts can look like in a, in a client that you're working with? Like, for example, let's say someone's coming in and getting close to burnout. You know, usually what that means is there's an ambitious part that's running amok in a sense. Um, so so the exhaustive part is basically getting pushed out, not listened to. Mm -hmm. And then basically when they get to burnout, you know, they can't do anything but stop. You know, they have no choice. Their body closes down. But typically, you know, like I say, there's certain parts that are just in the lead and they just, you know, and they don't, they're not touchy feely parts and they're just doing what they want. I mean, you can divide parts themselves, these ego states. They're also called ego states in psychodynamic and in in other models. And I think of them as ego states because they have ego and they have like an opinion. I define it as having an opinion. So anytime you have an opinion, that's like a part of you with that opinion. And I, yeah, so that's usually how I hear the parts too. Mm -hmm. So we're working on a topic and then some part has, you know, they say one thing, you know, some parts are angry that they're, you know, not uh, like, for example, let me just think of a client that I've been uh, editing some video for that gets pretty deep. Um, yeah, there's some rock'em sock'em stuff going on there. I, I have a structure for when parts are, are having this dissonance where I actually have a, a technique I call clear communication. So first what I do is I connect, right? This actually gets pretty deep. So I don't know how far I wanna go in explaining this here, but you know, I connect to what I call core self or to a non-judgmental place inside them. I'm blending parts so they get more neutral. And once they trust this kind of higher state of being within the person, then, then basically, I do that with both parts that maybe have that are disagreeing with each other or the team leaders there could be a group of them on both sides and I take the one most adamant on both sides. And then I basically set up a structure where they talk it out to work through their differences and to be honest very often i'd say 90% of the time within one or two exchanges back and forth. They end up being almost like best friends because what they realize is each one is trying to help from their own perspective of what they think is helpful and you know the person and uh so so very often they still may not agree with each other but they kind of as they hear each other's perspective they widen their own perspective until eventually there's maybe some overlap where they can find a solution that fits both of their like the venn diagram where there's an overlap and they find that point in the middle where they that they both are okay with good enough for both of them and that boom now they got a solution that they both can sign off on and there could be a third one same way you know they as they listen to each other they widen their own perspective as they take in the other perspective and then eventually there could be overlap and then it's really so they're not doing anything they don't want to do they're, they're finding a solution that works for all of them. And that could be multiple parts. Mm. What's so fascinating about this as I hear you talk about the process is how much in my mind it 
even though I know the process is quite different, it sounds like mediation, like the legal process of mediation, bringing, you know, these conflicted individuals together. And that's what's so fascinating to me about the parts work is they really are like their own in a sense, like at least in some way, like their own personality, their own thoughts and opinions. And at least what it sounded like you were saying is like, they each need to be heard. And once that happens, they can settle down a bit. Like they can reach this place of neutrality, which sounds like is the goal for calming the individual overall, like having that person reach a point of, you know, being settled down a bit. Yeah, I mean, like I say, it can go into a lot of depth of explaining yes. it. But basically, as you get to this core self or this non-judgmental place inside you relative to the part you're working with, mm. um, you know, the part feels more seen, validated, and not judged. So what I do is I unblend parts that are positive towards it or negative towards it until they get more neutral. And once they really feel seen in this way where they're not feeling judged positively or negatively, but it, you know, this is something shifts and that's just the first stage of the process with working with one part. But, uh, but so what they'll do is they'll trust you in your kind of higher state of being, but they won't still necessarily trust other parts of you that they're polarized with. So then I do it with the ones that they're, you know, that they're polarized with, and then we have them work out their differences. But once they know they trust you, not necessarily your other parts, and then we set that sets the stage for a better communication and then i just have them one speak on one point to the other one and before the other one responds i make sure that they they feel they understood it and if if they say yes then i ask the other one did they feel they understood it and if they say yes then uh and you know and how's that feel to be heard and understood not necessarily if they agree with them and that calms them down and like i say you only need about two exchanges mm -hmm. if the other one felt they didn't understand them i just say they stand understand what they're saying then i just have them explain further what they think they were missing and so forth so it's a it just you know that's just one technique but it's a lot of interesting uh things going on i'll give you an example like one time i was working with a guy in scandinavia that was like the head of you know um uh, I forget what it was. It's been many years, sales or something. And we had a meeting of his parts. We had a, like a conference room, kind of like a conference room where a bunch of different parts showed up. And then, um, and basically, he wasn't satisfied. And he had like doubled or tripled their profits in the last couple of years. And he was like the top guy, and he's doing really great on the books. But he wasn't happy. And then all of a sudden at the meeting, one of the parts was like outside looking in the window, you know, of the meeting that he had in his mind, you know, set up. And, uh, and then we asked it, like, why is it outside the window? And it was the part that was dissatisfied because he was always in the office all the time. And before he used to travel around to the different locations and he didn't even realize that's the thing that was really upsetting him. And he, and he realized also he's the boss, so he can do whatever he wants. So he could go back and start to travel around to the different locations, which he enjoyed doing. And so, you know, but we, he didn't know, he didn't realize that's what, even what was bothering him, you know, until that part was showed up outside the window and then explained why it was upset, you know? Oh, so interesting. Well, that story, I mean, it brings up a couple things. One is the concept that these parts, you know, in a sense through this process are in physical space. You can see them or, or conceptualize them. Right. And I think that's part of your method, right? Can you describe that part? Yeah. You know, I call it personal mythology and my Joker part calls it that. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually see it that way, to be honest. Um, I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Like, did we create, you know, was, you know, did someone write about mythology and then we internalize it and then we projected it, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is these parts of self, again, I have to explain the different parameters. So if you're in dream logic, hypno logic, or just emotional, it's all the same. Um, and then it's more metaphoric and symbolic and nonlinear. So that's like in dreams, things are going on. And, um, and you know, you're, you're walking, you're flying, you're morphing from one thing to another. And when you wake up and try to think about the dream, you're thinking, wow, how did it shift from here to here? And now I'm like this and I'm like that. But you notice when you're in the dream, you never question these shifts because you're in a different state of logic. I call it dream logic. So dream logic, hypno logic, and emotional intelligence are all the same. And it's much wider parameters. It's also like the example of someone who has a fear of flying 
but they know logically, rationally that, you know, the, you know, driving on the highway is higher risk of getting injured than in, on a plane or dying. But they may know it logically, but it doesn't matter because this is emotional intelligence. So that's why they still can't fly on the plane, but they still can, you know, drive on the highway because it's not about rational logic. It's a different kind of logic. And so that's going on at work all the time. You know, you think you're being rational, but we're very emotional too. And that really, so you got to fight fire with fire, I like to say, you know, you got to deal from where, where things are actually happening. Well, that the I'm glad you brought up the symbolism because like that guy outside the window, right? People get to start to interpret like the actual symbolism of what that means. And I think it can be, bring really new and important meaning into their understanding that in other methods might be more challenging. Um, the other thing is, and I'm laughing because I'm part of my brain is still thinking about that, the dream logic. My daughter was telling me a dream she had where like somebody was out to get her and her brother and she immediately morphed into a dinosaur to protect him. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's just so interesting how, you know, and when you think about it in that way, like how obvious of a reaction, but the way that our brains just do that so fluidly while we're sleeping or in that state. I mean, there's another aspect also. So these different parts of self, these ego states can be a, you know, developmental, developmentally of different ages. So younger, younger kid parts can be more egocentric, um, concrete thinking, black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. And some of those parts are at work, believe me, you know, they can be, you know, being, you know, if you think of narcissism or something like that, you know, very egocentric. Um, yeah. But, it, but it's not, I don't, I don't judge, you know, it's not like good or bad or right or wrong in my mind, because some of that is good too, because it, it gets you to do things that other people wouldn't try because you believe in yourself so much that you're willing to do. So a little bit of, it's not about having this or that. It's about balance. It's not about right or wrong. It's about balance mm -hmm. and harmony. I like to say that a lot. So it, it's, but, it, but if something's like overdoing it and kind of taking overdoing, over, it, yeah it kind of can mess you up. And and then also uh, there's a lot, there's so many things I can say about it that I, I'm not, I, I don't want to bore everybody with too much uh, detail. right mm -hmm. now. No, but it's, you know, I, I love how these get illustrated. I think, you know, for folks listening, we all recognize like certain parts of ourself that like when present, we feel really good or we recognize that part or, you know, other parts where we're like, like for me, clearly my nurturing slash mom part can really conflict with my adventurous part, right? My mm -hmm. adventurous part just wants to be off, like not worrying about a darn thing, just having adventures and not mm -hmm. worrying about physical safety, none of it, right? And then my nurturer part really gets very busy worrying about all the people doing all the things right and so you know i think there are some obvious ways that you know as we listen to this we can like begin to self-identify i'm curious is the way that people can start to as they're thinking about this to start to recognize that a part is speaking does that show up through thoughts, feelings, judgments. I heard you say opinions. Is that the way that you go like, oh, there's a part. What like, that's a different part speaking. Well, as you get to know your parts <laughs> and the roles they're in, their job descriptions, and you, know, you start to recognize who's there. By the way you're acting or the way you're speaking or whatever, because they're all different. So uh -huh. one way to do, there's many dichotomies of parts. So one is, one is gender. Sometimes you'll have opposite gender parts. Um, like my humanistic part is a female part. <laughs> and so and I have, I know, I know that I have a super strong masculine part. Yeah. And that's normal. Everyone usually has at least one or two of the opposite gender. Some people mm -hmm. more, some less, but that's one dichotomy. Another dichotomy of parts is, you know, like I say, uh, some, well, I didn't say this exactly before, but logic based ones, you know, the rational logic based ones, and then the emotional base, they, they always seem to divide that way also. So, you know, let's say these, these rational logic based ones, you know, they're really good at figuring stuff out, but they're not the best spokesman because even though they mean well, and they're coming from a good place, they sound kind of 
mechanical tin like you know and and, and so you, they don't have the um the um uh this the the sound in the voice that that mm -hmm. feels very empathetic or caring you know so and people hear that so i often you know when people are getting reactions out of people they don't understand why it's usually because they have some part of them that's the wrong messenger that you know mm -hmm. So the intonation of their voice isn't really the, what people hear that more than they hear what they're saying sometimes. So. Well, and I bet that in your years of working with this model and, you know, so many clients that you can actually probably label some of those parts as you just hear people speak, hear them come up, right? Well, more importantly, because, the, the, you know, there is some universality to it, mm -hmm. like the, you know, certain types of parts. You know, like the people pleaser, that's a common one that a lot of people have, um, but each person's is their own. So, and they're all shaped by your experiences over time, how they get to be the way they are. So though two people may have a people pleaser, they may not be really exactly the same. And, um, and you know, the issue with that kind of part is sometimes pe other people try to take advantage of that part, you know, so they feel like they have problems with boundaries because other people are taking, you know, using that part of them you know, they're, they're all, they're helping too much. And then they feel taken advantage of, and they're upset, all kinds of things that goes on. So yeah, there's universalities of parts of certain types of parts, like ambitious parts. That's a very mm -hmm. common part. Um, but each person's are their own. So, and, and basically as we work with the parts, they kind of get to know the persona of that part, its personality, its age, it's um it's modus operandi and so they can hear when that part comes in they get to know it themselves so it's not like yeah i kind of can hear some stuff but it's more like as you deconstruct and you see it and you get to know it like i said the metaphor so often people will see the parts maybe 70 80 percent maybe not initially but after a few times they will start to see them and they'll get a visual and it won't make any sense initially, but it, it, but I call it a priori, and that's my butchering of philosophy, because I, don't, I, don't, I never really studied it except for fun. So, but what I mean is you get the image first, and, and it may not really make any sense initially why that part looks like that. Mm -hmm. But as you get to know the dynamics of that part, how it got there, what it's up to, what its role is, then it makes total sense, but you never understood it initially. So it's not like you're creating these things to fit what you're, what's going on. It's actually, it's already there and you're just discovering what's inside you already and you're getting to know that. And it, that really is interesting to me. Yes, well, it's, you know, full disclosure, you had gifted me a session, which I went through and in reflecting later, this came to me much later because you had asked me about my adventurous part and how old it was, mm -hmm. right? And at the time I was like, hmm, 35 36 ish you know that's when I had my first child mm. right and I was reflecting back later on this conflict between the nurturing part and the adventurous part and it just clicked like it made so much sense why in my mind my adventurous self is still 35 mm -hmm. right so it is fascinating and it's totally you're right it's totally symbolic and it's already there it's about just paying attention to it long enough to understand that deeper meaning and there's other factors too like dissociation so let's say you're getting in a new relationship and some parts of you that like to be wild let's say all of a sudden you can't be wild anymore so that part gets pushed out you know it's mm. it's exiled and, um, you know, so it just depends or you work for a new company, you know, and the way you relate to different people. So you got to like, like my joker part, you know, I let it be there. You know, if I had a dog, I'd have it be in the office with me too, you know, but, but, uh, but they don't allow it in the building, but you know, it's not for everybody, but, but a little bit of humor is actually very helpful. I think, mm -hmm. um, the right amount, appropriate amount. And actually that part of me is, you know, it's, it, it likes to think of itself as the smart one. <laughs> yeah. The, hum the humorous part. Yeah. It always gives me images and, you know, and then I'll, I will reflect some of the thoughts, you know, or the picture it gives me, cause it gives me a metaphor, you know, a picture mm -hmm. or something, you know, and then I, but it's usually appropriate. It really fits or it likes to name the other people's parts before they do, even though I let them do it, 
but just to speed up the process and this part's got a pretty good batten record so it's like 80 90 percent accurate <laughs> totally so will even after to speed it up you know and then they see if it resonates or not or then they will shift it to what feels right mm. or or sometimes like you know, I'll ask the part what it wants to be called, and then we get a better understanding how it sees itself. But if it calls itself some rude name, you know, I, I don't know if I should say that online, but, yeah. uh, you know, you assume the part didn't name itself that, and another nice. part that's upset with that part named it. I have a really <laughs> cute clip of that with a person. And it's, um, you know, and then, you know, like, what does it want to be called, you know, negative Nancy? Oh, well, you know, and this person allowed me to actually use this for promotion, but yeah. And, that doesn't really sound well at first i'm like hmm it sure wants to be called negative nancy and then and then the person said well no it wants to be called the joy killer <laughs> and I'm, then i started smiling and myself like i don't think this part's naming itself you know like it wouldn't call itself you know some bad areas some of this part is naming it and then i said if this part was to name itself or how it sees itself what what would it say mm -hmm. and it called itself the responsible right right and it was when she had a child at 21 and she had to become responsible so it was like there when she was 21 and she had to stop you know she had it she goes, i had to be responsible you know just i had no choice and that part's with her at work you know it's a very strong part later we found out it was a male part <laughs> uh. <laughs> and uh and some other parts but it was like or another part where she said her boss saw her you know her eyes were like lasers when she was upset you know and, and she's a very cute person but you know you wouldn't think that and at first yeah. she's thinking like yeah, at first she thought it was wrong but then when she thought about it and we're working this way she's like she starts laughing she goes yeah that's true actually totally I know true. <laughs> like, so it is really fun actually people really can have fun with this but not it's not for everyone like i say so it's you gotta mm -hmm. see if you really want to get to know yourself in a deeper level and apply it to being more productive or effective or generally really about more, being more happy i think because i feel if you're in your passion if you're not in your passion the problem with employers hiring me um you know is i'm going to get the person to go where they go i don't i don't tell them where to go they go right. where they go. And it may, you know, if they're truly not satisfied, you know, either they might leave or they're going to leave. You know, so it's like if, you know, mm. if you believe in your company or you believe in yourself and you want to put your top guy in there, that's good. But they're going to find themselves wherever that is. Mm. You know? Well, yeah. and truthfully, the companies that are doing it right should support that. Like if 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 this person is not for us, it's better that we all learn this. Right. And vice versa. That's right. So, that's right. yeah, people, I mean, I've worked with some some pretty high comp uh, you know top companies and they have that belief like like that they want to go mm -hmm. let them go you know like they're partners and stuff yeah and they don't you know, they're okay with it because they want them you know they want them present they want them productive they want them happy they don't want to bring down the mood of the whole place you know totally totally um there's a couple things that come to mind for me there i loved what you said about not seeing things as like negative or positive. And I think that's important because we have so many self labels, right? And we well, right we, and wrong, yeah, right and wrong, positive, negative, right? And it reminds me, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dr. John Demartini. He's actually another guy I've had on the podcast, but he he does a process that I love. It's different, but the the outcome, the goal really sounds the same, which is to achieve this greater level of balance within the whole so mm -hmm. that for people who are overly, and you use the word like triggered or mm -hmm. like drawn towards something or repelled by something, right? Having really strong judgment either way, like, oh, that's, and it, it can even be like in, in who we're drawn to in life, like seeing this person as somebody that belongs up on a pedestal or this person, you know, really is not up to much, blah, blah, blah. We're labeling them or judging them in some way. And it's really about recognizing we have all of it in ourselves. It's not good or bad. It's about doing the work to remove those triggers and the, the either, either being overly drawn or overly repelled by something so that we do feel more centered and this feeling of balance in our thoughts, our judgments, our opinions, you you know, our parts. But I love that because I think that if people can stop judging themselves so harshly, mm -hmm. they, you know, they have an opportunity to, to do this work 
probably faster and earlier on their journey. Yeah, and I think of that as a part that's judging them harshly. And usually we also can internalize negative outside energy through what's called mirror neurons. So we can bring in, you know, often when we are being self-critical or other critical, I don't think we're born that way. I think we learn it, we internalize it. So, you know, whatever you bring in that isn't originally from you, you can also take out if you know how to do it. Um, well, so. and I love that you mentioned that because the other question that I had is, do you ever, are there parts that people abandon, remove, process their way out of, right? Because they don't belong to you them. You can't get rid of your parts because the parts of you. And like mm -hmm. I say, there are no bad parts. Uh, you can't separate negative outside energy. You internalize from other situations, maybe when you're bullied, when you're little or. Right. You know, and that's what I'm things. thinking of. Yeah. It's almost kind of. Um, and I know this is a different topic, probably would spiral us into a totally different conversation, but even like epigenetics, <laughs> yeah, right? Epigenetic type stuff, things right. that through childhood, whether it's emotionally, intuitively, sometimes I think just through physical energy, we inherit things from people that are not our own. Like, mm -hmm. does that stuff come up where somebody's able to recognize like, oh, that's not mine. That's not mine to carry well, any absolutely. longer. Absolutely. You know, I think I showed you a clip of a guy that, you know, this real critical part that's telling me he's not so, so hot. He's not so great as he thinks he is, you know, and, you know, and then also when he got the image, it was this homeless person uh, in Seattle. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Seattle. Yeah. Him, they used to give him, yeah, I used to give him a hard time when he was walking home saying, you're not so great as you think you are, you know, you know, oh. he was like, um, or living in a truck or something. And it, I mean, when he got the energy, it looked just like that guy. So he knew that's where that energy came from. And, and I have a pretty simple test to see if they, it is from outside. I, I check, there's a lot more to it. I mean, sometimes they're mm. internalized into one of your parts. Sometimes they're, they're just what I call a free floater in your self system. But yeah, so, so yeah, and you know, with my, my, my litmus test is just, I check with the, the part or the entity and see, is, is it from them originally or from outside? And then mm -hmm. I do the opposite. I check with them if it feels like inside or out. But anyway, there's a lot of things that, that, that's not so common, but I do a little bit of that. I mean, when it comes up, I, I work with it, but that's just more on the exception, but it does happen mm -hmm. a little bit more. I've developed a lot of this, you know, over, you know, 20 years. So I've evolved even that part. That's the part I've evolved most in the last five or seven years, but it's, it is fascinating. I mean, the main thing is connecting to core to get them the part grounded within its, you know, cause when you're grounded, then you can ground your part. And then you also learn how to ground that part when it's getting triggered. So when you're getting triggered in a certain way, you know, uh, what part of you it is that's being triggered and you know how to comfort or get that part into a safe place so it calms down and then you calm down then you feel better so when you're at work and let's say something's you know you, you're feeling reactive you know what part of you it is you know where that part would like to be and so forth so you use imagery a lot to get that part in the right space and then when mm. it calms down you calm down so it's, mm, it's very exact, very specific instead of some general, usually people use breathing techniques and all mm -hmm. that. I use those things, but they that just suppresses things. It doesn't go to the root and solve them and deal with them. Mm, right. No, getting to the root cause. I mean, that's so fascinating because I think what I'm hearing you say is like people leave this experience literally having a better understanding of themselves. And that's not always the case. Yeah. Not just not just a better understanding, but also knowing how to work with themselves in a way mm -hmm. so that they're, you know, feeling more grounded and more, you know, I had one person, for example, you can separate a part from a part. It's like fractals, worlds within worlds. Um, so I had one client that had this part that was, um, what was it, very cautious and his ambitious mm -hmm. part Jack was up. He named the part named itself Jack. Yeah. It's really, you know, it's very funny the way you describe it. He's like a little narcissistic. He's a little ambitious. He's like, if I got to work 20 hours a day to get there. I'm going to work 20 hours a day to get there. And all this kind of that was Jack, you know. And he was tired of these other parts that were holding him back, like the cautious part and all this stuff. And he wanted to be more productive. 
So then what we did is, you know, we worked with the part that was polarized with the cautious part that was being overly cautious, you know, which was just holding Jack back, right? And that part originally started out, I forget what age, but he was a bit timid and shy and all that. And it's like when he was like 14 mm -hmm. or something. And then when we separated out, um, well, and it was nervous to be at the big table with the big boys like Jack and the other players. So he was a little nervous to be there. So when we separated out the part of it that was nervous from the cautious part, underneath was a thoughtful part, which is older actually, and we kind of freed it up. And then the next meeting, the next week, things totally shifted for him. Like he was like, he wasn't, he wasn't blocking himself. He wasn't even thinking as much. It was more easy. He let in other parts that were good at what they did instead of holding them back. And he was getting a lot more accomplished and it was, and it, he wasn't working as hard. That's what he said. I have it in video. I'm going to actually put it on my website eventually. I'm trying to edit it. That's now. a great testimonial, right? Uh, yeah. He's oh, funny the guy to boot, to boot. He's funny. <laughs> I, I really enjoy it. I mean, it is a lot of fun uh, mm -hmm. for me and for my clients typically. Mm -hmm. No, I can see that you enjoy it. Well, I want to be respectful of our time. I love this conversation. I think some people probably just had their minds blown and others are like, whoa, this is very, you know, curious and interesting. And I want to learn more for folks that would like to connect with you or learn more. Where do you show up online? Uh, let's see. My website is called mind solutions with an S um, and then dot and my assistant told me to say N U. And I, I think he told me to say it a certain way so everyone knows. So N like in Nancy, U like in universe. So not the usual dot com. Someone right. is owning that and they want a hundred thousand dollars for it or something. So I just took N U. Uh, so again, mind solutions dot N U. He did write to say it twice. <laughs> and then uh, let's see. And then I'm also on LinkedIn under Mind Solutions uh, Executive Coaching. And one-on-one, uh, -on -one. I generally work one-on-one. -on -one. Mm, awesome. Well, we will be very happy to share those links and anything else you want us to share over at the show notes page. So folks hop over to legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast, find Dr. David Schultz's episode, and you can connect with him there. Um, David, do you have, and really quick, I had to look up that .nu domain name. It yeah. is the country code top level domain representing, and I don't know how you say this, new N I U E, a tiny island nation located around 2,400 kilometers northeast of New Zealand. Yeah, I there think you, you told me that once before. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for, for your research. You're so right. I obviously didn't lodge that deep enough into my brain. I had to look it up again, but that's fun. Um, so I think you've got a gift for people that are listening. And we should say, if you qualify, this can't be for anybody that shows up to your door because it is a commitment and very generous of you to offer this. Yeah. So basically I'm going to offer like a, I think I wrote a 75 minute session on there mm -hmm. or did I say 90? I can't remember what I don't know. 75. Let's keep it at 75. I'm not going to volunteer you for 90. I just forgot what I wrote. But yes, so that you can have the experience, see what it feels like. But of course, you know, the qualification is just that it, you know, it fits your budget, that it's something you're serious about. And then totally. I'm happy that you have the experience. Yeah. Well, I am super excited to share this episode out. I can't wait for folks who will have some new ideas around potential avenues for greater inner peace, balance in their lives, harmony in their work life. It's, um, it is a never ending quest. It seems like some days. So, and I think, what were we going to call this episode? Mind uh -huh. the final frontier. Mm -hmm. And you called me a Trekkie. Uh, <laughs> a Trekkie. Yes. You called me that. Yes. Um, I don't know that I am that I do like sci-fi and <laughs> fantasy, but I like all kinds of stuff. But yes, I, I really feel like we're just beginning on the mind. I mean, we really don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, where are these parts hanging out between while well, we're not talking to them? What are they up to? You know, cause what they're definitely, they doing? it's like, the, like when you just wake up right before the alarm goes off, like what part of you is paying attention to that? You know, that's yes. what I see. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, what final could either be a thought or a takeaway, like an action step that people can go do. What would you like to leave people with? 
Well, if you're just curious about how, who you are and how things operate within you, I would say that alone is enough reason to check things out because mm -hmm. it is, it is unbelievable. And just to get to know who the players are and just to deconstruct self besides all the things that we can do with that. It's just, it's just fascinating. It's like getting your, you know, getting checked for your, like what, you know, what your ancestry is and learning mm -hmm. all that. It's the same thing that this is another thing, but it's like that. Totally. And you have to live with this all the rest of your life. So why not get to know it a little better, right? <laughs> it helps a lot. And it also helps you understand other people better. Yeah, it's huge. Thank you, David. So grateful to have you here today. Thank you, Heather. Nice to be here. Bye-bye.